I wonder how patient and understanding you are when it comes to waiting. When you need to wait for someone, when you need to wait for something, are you good at being patient? Are you good at sitting still, at standing still, waiting for a long period of time, appearing at ease both on the inside as well as the outside? Are you good at waiting? Well, how about this one? How many of you are good at waiting when you're at the Secretary of State's office? Isn't that a fun place to go? You know, and you might say, well, Sean, there's new technology now. You can just use your phone. You can, you can text in. You can call in. You can schedule an appointment so you no longer have to wait. And yet, even with the, the very best of, of technology, we are still going to spend some time waiting to register a new vehicle, to transfer plates, whatever it is you're doing down there at the Secretary of State's office. And sitting there... I recently looked up at the little digital screen and it told me that they were serving number 31. Well, good for number 31. I looked at my little stub of a ticket and I found out that I was blessed to be number 67. Well, praise the Lord. (laughs) It's just an opportunity to be patient and to trust him, right? How good are you at waiting? Well, Peter has been faithful. Peter is a trusted brother in Christ, one of the apostles, and he's approaching death. He knows that. He knows how he's going to die. Remember, Jesus told him how, and yet Peter is more concerned about us than he is himself. And Peter is going to speak to us one more time this morning, and he's reminding us that Christ will return. Amen, church? He's coming back. But between now and that moment, there's time for us to wait. (laughs) But we're not waiting for ice to melt, (laughs) as Miss Vicky showed us. No, while we are waiting, we are called to be a, a certain people, and we are called to do some certain things, not wasting any of this important moment. And Peter speaks to that in 2 Peter chapter 3 as we pick up at verse 11. Listen to the word of God. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish, and at what? At peace." And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Read that last sentence with me again, Peter's doxology, and we read, To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. This weight matters, and how we wait matters, and what we do while we are waiting matters for the return of Jesus Christ. And so while we are waiting, Peter uh, encourages us and he reminds us that we are supposed to have a forever focus. Say that with me, a forever focus. 
And he begins to speak to that at verse 11. He says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and and godliness waiting? He says, you've been listening to me. You've been listening to all of my instruction. I've been telling you about these false teachers. I've been speaking truth into your life. I've been encouraging you and and, and letting you be aware that Jesus is going to return. And he says, as you think about all of those things, as you focus on the return of Christ, yes, you are waiting, verse 12, but you are to be waiting with a forever Focus. Jump back in there at verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. You see, this this forever focus reminds us that this world is not going to be forever. We were reminded last week that that sin was judged once before when God brought about the great flood with the waters rising up from below and falling for the first time from above and and except for, for Noah and his family, all life perished except for those animals who came in two by two, so called by God and, and sealed up in the ark. As God first judged sin by water, this time he is going to judge sin by fire. And the heavens and the earth will burn and they will be dissolved. They will melt according to verse 12. You see, God is going to judge sin. Sin has a price. Sin has eternal consequences. This world is going to pass away. But that doesn't bother us because knowing that this world is temporary, understanding that this world is not our home, we are a people who are forever focused. Look down there at verse 13 that points us to forever. He says, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You see, this is our forever focus. We know that God is going to bring about new heavens and a new earth. New speaks to the quality of it all. It is new in terms of righteousness. We are able to sing holy, holy, holy this morning. We're able to sing of the holiness of God. We are able to sing of the righteousness of God. And when the new heavens and the new earth appear, it's going to be full of the righteousness of God. No longer temptation, no longer sin, no longer struggle, no longer pain, no longer tears, no longer heartache, no longer any kind or type of disappointment. Church, can you say amen to that promise? That is ours through the blood of Jesus Christ. And as we are waiting, that is to be our forever focus. I wonder how many of us talk about heaven. I wonder how many of us uh, make it a priority to talk about the the new heavens and the new earth and the righteousness of God. It is so easy to to talk about a recent vacation. It is so easy to talk about the weather. It is so easy to talk about how many times you had to mow your lawn this week. It's so easy to to talk about your job or or what you're planning to have for another meal. But I, I wonder how many of us take the time to speak of this forever focus in the glory of heaven. It seems that the people of God should. When we are speaking about our eternity, when we are speaking about everlasting life, that that should be what is upon our mouths. That should be what we're we're thinking about in our minds and, and what we're feeling in our hearts. That God is so good and that he has prepared this place for us. And so Peter says, while you're waiting, you be those who wait with a forever focus. And you be those waiting who also never forget you are secondly forgiven. Say that one with me. We are forgiven. So live like it. At verse 14, he says, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, 
Be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at what? At peace. You see, that's our word of forgiveness right there. Peter reminds us to, to have that forever focus. He says, you be thinking about heaven. You be thinking about the return of Jesus Christ. You be diligent in that. <laughs> don't, don't become lukewarm. Don't become complacent. Don't, don't become so fixated or focused on something of this world that has nothing to do with God. He says, you be diligent and you wait because Christ is going to return and you want him to find you ready and willing and waiting. And he says, when he comes back, remember, he's forgiven you. By the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you are at peace with God. You have been forgiven because of and through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But you see, here's what's going to happen in the meanwhile. We, we are people who who sing of our forgiveness, and we are people who, who, who teach of, of our forgiveness. And yet Satan does not want us having that confidence. He does not want us having that assurance. And so while we are waiting, <laughs> Satan is whispering, are you sure you're good enough? Are you sure you've done enough? Are, are you sure that, that God loves you? Are you sure that the blood of, of Jesus has forgiven you? Are you sure that you can be forgiven of, of that one thing? Are you sure that you can be forgiven of those things? Are you sure that you can be forgiven in the midst of the struggle that you find yourself in? You see, Satan never brings an answer. All he ever does is raise questions. But Peter says, don't give in to those questions. Peter says, do not become a people of doubt. Remember what Christ has fully accomplished for you. You're at peace with God. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. Say that with me. You are forgiven. Loud one more time. You are forgiven. You see, that's what Jesus says. And we need to live like it. Don't listen to Satan. He's not only a liar, he's the father of lies. Number one, we have a forever focus, anticipating the return of Jesus Christ and, and our everlasting life. Number two, we are people who are forgiven. We're at peace with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. As, as we wait, we are also called to be, number three, faithful. Say that with me. Faithful. We are called to, to be faithful. We are called to faithfully live as those who bear the name of Christian. We bear the name of Christian because we are disciples and we are followers of Jesus Christ. Christ is our identity and we want people to see how our lives have been transformed because of Christ. And so when people look at us, they should see us as a people who are faithfully living. Now, verse 14 points to what that faithfulness looks like. It says, be found by him without spot or blemish. You see, this, this faithfulness says you, you try to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. You try to live a life without spot. Now, what is spot? Spot is sin. It speaks to our actions. It speaks to the choices that we make. What, what do you decide to think about or fixate upon in your mind? What do you decide to say with your mouth or to text or tweet or Snapchat out to someone else? What do you decide to do with your body? You see, all of this refers to actions. It refers to choices that we make. But faithful people make godly choices. We do not want to live lives of, of spot or stain we do not want to be a people who pursue sin. And so our actions during the day and our actions under the disguise and darkness of night should seek to avoid sin and temptation. And faithful people are also a people who, who do not want to appear blemished. Now, blemish refers to our reputation. Say that with me, our reputation. 
So, so people look at the Christian, people look at the woman or the man of faith, and, and they should be able to say, wow, I can tell that you are a person of godly character. I can tell that you are a person of faith. I, I see how you're living. Your reputation speaks for itself. But be careful. Be careful because you can appear to have a godly reputation. You can appear to have a faithful reputation on the outside while still pursuing sinful spots under the cover of night. That's why it's so important to read God's word and, and to see the order that the Spirit puts the words in, right? First, we address those spots. We address that stain. We address how we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we do that, that process of sanctification, then our reputation will present itself truthfully and honestly. So as we wait for Jesus Christ, we are a faithful people, living life and presenting life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Fourthly, we're waiting, and while we're waiting, we're thinking about our family. Say that with me, our family. We're thinking about the family of God. And you know what? Right now, someone's not here. There's a part of our family who is not here right now. There is, there is a woman, there is a man, there is an adult, there is a child, there is a family missing from the family of God. What does that mean? It means as long as we have this period of waiting, as long as God is patient, we should be busy about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and presenting it to those who are still not in right relationship with God. Verse 15 speaks to this opportunity for family to come in. It says, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. It reminds us last week we were at verse 9 in chapter 3, and it speaks to the patience of God. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is the desire and the design of God. We are waiting, but while we wait, it is not God's desire that we hide in a church building. It's not God's desire that we put that light under a bushel as we sing about at a young age. It's not God's desire that, that our faith be a, a holy huddle that, that, is, that is kept at home but never goes out and about with us. While we are waiting, we are called to make disciples of all nations. How well are we doing that? We say that it's something we're, we're passionate about, that we desire to see folks come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We say that we're interested in that, but, but let me ask all of us this question. Who are you urgently in prayer for right now? Who have you found yourself praying for? You have her name or, or his name written down. You may even have a, a picture. You may even be making notes of, of when you pray and, and what you pray for. You may be sending them correspondence. You may be sending them texts during the course of the day. You may be meeting with them, giving them <laughs> your best time, saying, when is it convenient for you? When does it work in your schedule? You see, if we're really concerned about the family of God and those who are not yet here, those who have not yet believed, they're loved by God, but they have not responded to Jesus Christ. If we are truly, <laughs> if we are truly concerned about their eternity, one of heaven or one of hell. 
then should we not be in prayer and in relationship and in conversation and in intentional interaction with them? Who is that one person for you? And if no one comes to mind this morning, if if there is no answer for you to that question, then let the word of God challenge you on that one. It's called the Great Commission. It shouldn't be the Great Omission. While we're waiting for Jesus Christ, we also need to be a people, number five, of fortitude. Say that with me, of Fortitude. What is fortitude? Fortitude is is strength. Well, how are we supposed to be strong or what are we supposed to be strong in? Well, we need to be fortified in the word of God. We need to be fortified. We need to be strong. We need to be knowledgeable. We need to be invested in the word of God. We need to be students of the word of God, lifelong learners who continue to go from Genesis to Revelation and then back again, not missing anything in between. We have to know the word of God well by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you are here only on a Sunday morning and you you fast the rest of the week, not taking in any of the word of God, then understand you're going to starve. You are starving your soul and your spirit. You are starving your relationship with Christ. We need to be those who are fortified and who are strong in the word of God. Why? Well, Peter, again, at verse 15, tells us, count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what he's saying? He's saying you need to be in the word. He he still kind of goes back and he tells us about these false teachers. And he he says, if you're not in the word, understand that there will be false teachers in the word and they will take things and they will twist it and they will contort it and they will manipulate it and they will use it to teach something that goes against the will of God. That is contrary to the word. Peter says, you need to be in the word. (laughs) even in the hard places and in the things that are difficult to understand. And he gives Paul, by the power of the Holy Spirit, credit for writing some of those difficult to understand passages. But we need to be fortified. We need to be strong in the word of God. It was just a few weeks ago that that everyone in their mailbox received a, a fellowship, discipleship, flyer, uh, a trifold, and it has the entire week outlined from Sunday through Saturday, opportunities for everyone, for men and women during the day and at night, opportunities to be in the word of God and held accountable in the study of God's word. We mentioned earlier the, 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 the Fellowship Church app. If you are someone who you know you need to be in God's word. And yet at times you say, I I didn't bring my Bible with me. If only I had my Bible, I could redeem this hour-long wait at the Secretary of State's office, right? And yet if you had the app, you could pull scripture up right there and you could redeem that time. Being fortified, being strengthened in the word of God. We need to be in that word. How many of you love football by show of hands? Any, anybody love football here? Yeah. You know, right now we're right back into football season again. And, uh, and Friday nights are busy. And they're wanting to bring you all the scores at, at, at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And you're staying up for that. But as you, as you look at the individual teams heading out onto the field, you know, what, what you don't see is all the practices beforehand. 
You, you don't see them showing up early in the morning, lifting and, and going through all the drills. You don't see them memorizing all the plays. You don't see them scrimmaging out on the field. You don't see all that work. But before they ever get out onto the field in competition against another team, there's all that strengthening, all that fortifying, all that work and commitment that is done. They would never head out onto the field until going through all that practice. I wonder if, if we were as committed to the word of God as we are towards some other endeavors, how strong we might be. What a beautiful picture that would be to be so strong and, and fortified in the word of God. One more, we're almost there. Finally, as we are waiting in, in this adventure, anticipating the return of Jesus, we need to be a people with clear focus. A people of clear focus. And, and finally, what is our focus? Well, who is our focus? Our focus is God. Our focus is God today. And our focus is the glory of God for all of eternity. Peter ends his letter with a doxology at verse 18. He says, To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Would you read that again with me? And we read saying, To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. You see, he is our focus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God who has created our lives. God who has redeemed our lives. And God who is sanctifying and sustaining our lives. You see, he is to be our focus. And he is our focus. Because we were, first of all, his focus. You see, God so loved you that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Before the foundations of this world, God chose you. God called you to spend an eternity in his glorious presence. God is that focused on you. And before he can be your focus in return, you need to receive that gift of Christ. You see, Jesus is coming back. He will return. When he does, all of those redeemed will celebrate a celebration that will never end. But for those who are still apart from him, it will be an eternal separation it will be the reality of hell. And it will be the full consequences of our sins. And so as, as Peter prepares to die in Christ, he's not afraid. But before he puts down his pen, he would want to know that everyone here has that same focus that same confidence and that same assurance. Are you forgiven by Christ alone? And if you are, have you made that confession known to the glory of God and for your eternal blessing? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, thank you that you would have the Spirit to spell out well your will through your faithful servant, Peter. And Father, not just a letter for us to 
snoop through, not just a letter for us to eavesdrop upon as it's read, but a letter for us to love and believe and a relationship with Jesus Christ for us to pursue. So if there be that one here today who now is desiring to say Jesus is my Savior and Lord, then Father, bless your church this afternoon and bless your elders to hear that confession. And Father, bless all of eternity to know that one more of your children has come home. And we will pray it always in Jesus' name. Amen.